So in the last couple of lectures, we've talked about mining waste streams. And I want to do a little review on the front end of today's lecture to remind you of that concept. And then walk through the final part of the mining waste stream. So these are images you've seen in previous lectures. And just as a reminder, top left would be the Bingham Canyon deposit circa 1900. And outlined in yellow is that massive copper-rich ore body. And then on the lower right, you can see this massive open pit mine that is the result of mining since 1906. And remember that one of the things we talked about is as the mining company mines all of the ore grade rock within the yellow bounds here, in order to make the pit wider, to make it deeper, they have to also mine to the right of the ore body and the left of the ore body a lot of additional overburden that does not create profit for the mining company, but has to be moved for the safety of the open pit mine infrastructure. When we looked at overburden in a previous lecture, we talked about this topic, the stripping ratio. And remember that overburden divided by the amount of ore grade rock is how we determine the stripping ratio. So the lower the stripping ratio means the less overburden you have, and the more overburden you have, the higher the stripping ratio. So mines increase their profitability by reducing the amount of overburden within the boundaries of safety for an open pit or underground mine infrastructure. We looked at this slide, and here again are some of the metals from the Old Testament, or what we call the metals of antiquity. So gold, copper, silver, iron, and lead. And the only thing I want to remind you of here is the histogram shows you as is indicated here lower right, the amount of ore grade rock relative to waste rock. And here the waste rock is the volume you need to move to access the useful ore. So this would be the overburden. And if you look at the histogram, for example, for copper, what you can see is that globally, a significant amount of overburden has to be removed in order to actually process ore grade rock to produce copper. And it's the same for iron and gold and zinc and other metals. And all of that is stored on site in these mountains of waste rock that we looked at in a previous lecture. This is one such example where we've got a haul truck at the top and it's dumping overburden. And this will be stored here in perpetuity. And the reason a mining company would never put the overburden back into the pit is that would generate no revenue and would be an expense that the company would have to absorb. And so there's no sound business plan that allows that or would cause that to happen. We looked at ore grade rocks, such as the photograph on the left, where all of the opaque minerals are sulfide, such as chalcopyrite. And we talked about how mining companies mill the ore grade rock so that it is reduced in size to about the consistency of baking flour. We then used froth flotation to separate the chalcopyrite from all of the gang minerals. So that schematic is shown here where we put the pulp in on the left. The pulp would be the ore grade rock plus water plus pine oil. And then we blew air in from the top. And we talked about how tailings ponds are constructed so that this outlet here, number four, all of that pulp that remains or gang that remains after being separated from chalcopyrite here at the top, all of that is stored in tailings ponds on site. Here is a photograph of the Oak Teddy mine in Papua New Guinea. And we talked about the environmental degradation caused here when an earthquake caused liquefaction and the failure of a tailings dam before mining practices commenced. And the company was then able to not build the tailings dam, but rather dump the tailings directly into the local river systems which has had a horrific environmental impact in Papua New Guinea. And the histograms on the right, just as another reminder of the waste stream, at Oak Teddy, this first histogram on the left is the waste rock, so that's all the overburden. The central histogram, this, these are the tailings, so this is all the waste rock that's left over after froth flotation to separate the chalcopyrite and other sulfides. And then the bottom here is the amount of copper in the ore and waste. So this is the amount of copper that is being extracted. And these are as a function of time. And you don't need to memorize these data, just to give you a sense of the various parts of the waste stream. Here are the tailings ponds we looked at. 
And I highlighted in a previous lecture that there are approximately 2,000 tailings ponds around the world. We talked about how they're constructed, downstream, upstream, and centerline construction. And this is a new slide, just to give you a sense of the number of tailings dams that fail on average over the last 100 years. And I want to make the point here and emphasize that the y-axis is the number of failures per decade. So we have at least 2,000 tailings dams on the planet. And if you look as a function of time, remember tailings dams are a relatively new invention. So if we go back to the 19th century and earlier, we weren't constructing tailings dams the way that we are now. So if you look at the actual failure rate, it's very low compared to the total number of tailings dams that are operating around the world. You can see the 1960s, 70s, and 80s that follows the global boom after World War II when record levels of consumption took over the developed world. And what you can see is an incredible number of dams being built in each of these decades, 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. And one interpretation of the number of failures is the absence of strict guidelines that regulated or legislated the way tailings dams had to be constructed. This is not the case today. So today when tailings dams are constructed around the world, there are very strict engineering protocols that mining companies are required to follow to reduce the potential environmental degradation associated with tailings dams. That doesn't mean they don't occur. In the 2010s, over the last decade, there have been at least eight tailings dam failures. And these data were published in 2014, so that number now I think is about 13 or 14. We talked about chemical weathering of the gang mineral pyrite, and for right now just eliminate from your mind all of these reactions. The goal here was just to emphasize that when we start with pyrite here, FES2 or iron sulfide, all of these reactions produce hydrogen, and the more hydrogen that's contained in water, the more acidic that water is, and that represents a huge potential negative for the local aquatic ecosystem. And that was shown here. If we think of the Berkeley pit, here's the water that has filled as of 2013. And just to focus you on the right, as you increase the amount of hydrogen, water becomes more acidic and the pH decreases. So we go from neutral water of seven and increasing hydrogen causes the pH to decrease six, five, four, three, two, one. We talked about how this is a log scale. And when we get to pHs below six, five, four, three, there are huge negative consequences for the aquatic ecosystem. So pyrite reactions with oxygen and water that produce acidic waters is very bad for the ecosystem. So let's talk about perhaps the final part of the waste stream, smelting. Now, in a previous lecture, I walked through how smelting is used to separate copper from iron and sulfur, because copper, iron, and sulfur are the three elements that make up the mineral chalcopyrite. And I showed you this still frame image here. And all I want you to remember is that the copper ore plus lime and sand is mixed together and then put into the furnace. And at very high temperatures, temperatures of 1100 degrees Celsius, oxygen is blown in and the reaction breaks the bonds that hold iron and copper and sulfur together. Now the key today is that some of that sulfur remains bound to copper to produce mat, which is this liquid that is tapped out here in this image on the left side. And matte has a composition of Cu2S, so it's about 70% copper, 30% sulfur. But some of that sulfur is also lost to the atmosphere when it mixes with this oxygen to produce SO2. And again, here we have blister copper, so the next step in smelting is to take that matte copper and we bubble oxygen through it. And when the oxygen reacts with sulfur in the matte, Oxygen plus sulfur equals SO2. That SO2 historically was vented to the atmosphere. And that produces blister copper, which is about 98 to 99% pure copper. 
So this process of smelting, one of the byproducts is sulfur dioxide gas. And historically, that SO2, or sulfur dioxide, was vented directly to the atmosphere. A question is, does that have negative environmental impacts? So another slide again that you've seen, and just here if we look at the reaction, when we're smelting chalcopyrite, a non-balanced, simplified reaction to emphasize the point for you is here's chalcopyrite, CUFES2, and I just want you to see that when chalcopyrite reacts at high temperature with oxygen, that liberates copper and produces sulfur dioxide. So the key here is all of the sulfur atoms in yellow are chemically separated from all of the copper atoms in blue and all of the iron atoms in orange. That results in SO2 that's a gas and historically that was directly emitted to the atmosphere. So what could the negative environmental implications be? I'm going to focus your attention here on an area called Sudbury, Ontario, which is about an 11-hour drive north from Ann Arbor. So Ann Arbor, to get to Sudbury, you could either drive due west, come across the Upper Peninsula, and then drive south. Or from Sudbury, you can drive southeast to Toronto and then across to Ann Arbor. Sudbury is one of the largest mining areas in the world. It is an area where significant metal in platinum, palladium, copper, zinc, lead are produced. And there have been smelters in the Sudbury area for more than 100 years. One of them is shown here. On the left, this is the Inco Super Stack. This is a second smelter stack here. And the Super Stack is a big chimney. It's 1,250 feet tall, and it's the tallest chimney in the Western Hemisphere. It's the second tallest chimney on Earth. And the chimney sits above a smelter. So this building here that I'm outlining with the laser pointer at the bottom, this is where sulfides are smelted. So sulfides plus oxygen equal the metal plus sulfur dioxide. And the reason that the smelter has this chimney that's so tall is all of that waste gas, all of that sulfur dioxide, and other particulate matter that are emitted during the process of smelting, those are vented out of the top of the chimney. And the concept historically was dilution is the solution to pollution. So the chimney was built very tall, the thought being that all of that gas would be admitted, in this case nearly a quarter mile above the earth, and that the atmosphere up here at the top would simply absorb that pollution, absorb all of that sulfur dioxide and other gaseous emissions, and just dilute them so that they were not a problem for society. We now know, if you look here at another image from a different vantage point of the super stack, you can see the emissions coming out of the super stack here. And this is a mixture of water vapor, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. And what I want you to see here is the wind is blowing. So when those emissions are released from the top of the super stack, the winds are blowing all of that material. And a question historically was, does all of that material simply stay aloft? Meaning, does it stay airborne? Does it remain in the atmosphere? Or can any of that material here find its way back to the surface of the Earth? Now, some numbers here, and I don't need you to memorize the numbers. Over the course of time at Sudbury, among the metals that they have measured is lead. Lead is a metal that we know has extremely negative impacts on human health and the health of any living organism in nature. And lead in particular causes significant cognitive delay in children who were exposed to lead at a young age. So they've monitored lead here for decades, and I'll show you some of those data in a subsequent slide. But I just want to plant the seed in your mind that originally the thought was build the stack or the chimney as high as possible. We can emit the gases and particulate matter as high as possible, and dilution is the solution to pollution. Now, one of the things that has occurred in the Sudbury area over the last few decades, if I focus your attention, the inset here is 
the northern part of North America. Here's the province of Ontario. And here is Sudbury here. And I just want to highlight that there are several smelters in Sudbury. Here's one, here's two, and here's three. I want to highlight that the prevailing wind direction is from the west to the east. So each one of these smelters, as emissions are being released at the top of the smelter, the wind is blowing all of that material from the west to the east on average over the course of the year. One of the things that has been measured in this area is the concentration of different metals released from the smelters in rain. So this is a contour map where if we look here, the inset again, top left is Canada, and you can see the Great Lakes here. We've then got the city of Sudbury here, lower left, each one of these dashed lines is what we call a contour line, and the numbers are the concentration of lead in rain in parts per million. Now that may seem very low, but lead is a metal that even at very low concentrations when it gets into the human bloodstream causes cognitive delays. So what you can see is a map that is the result of sampling rainfall over a large area around Sudbury, Canada, and again, remember the winds on average are blowing from west to east. And what the data indicate is this contour line that I'm tracing, that is a 50 part per million contour line. Everywhere within that line, the concentration of lead in rainwater exceeds 50 parts per million. If we then step out to this contour line that has the number 40 on it, everywhere on that contour line, rain samples were collected and the concentration of rain is 40 parts per million and then everywhere between this contour and that contour the concentration is between 40 and 50 and what you can see then as a function of distance away from Sudbury here we have a contour line 30 parts per million lead here we have a contour line 20 parts per million lead and so as you move farther away from Sudbury proper which has several smelters and several large super stacks or chimneys, you can see that the concentration of lead is highest, closest to Sudbury, and then decreases systematically as you move further away from Sudbury. But notice if we use the scale bar up here, which is 30 kilometers to about one inch, even at a distance of more than 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers, there are still much higher lead concentrations in rain than would naturally be there if there were no smelting operations in Sudbury. So these data that scientists started to produce in the 1980s and 90s and through today, they allow us to, in essence, create a bullseye that without any doubt unequivocally traces the source of the lead back to the smelting operations at Sudbury, and we now can investigate the negative potential impact of lead in rainfall falling on the surface, both lead that could be absorbed by humans or lead that might affect other members of the animal kingdom. One of the ways that we do that is by sampling local soils and rock. So this is a building here in downtown Sudbury and this black rock is black because it has been downwind of a smelter for more than a hundred years. And if you scrape the rock, as was done here for the purpose of taking this photograph, where the rock has been scraped, you can literally scrape away this black veneer or black surface, and all of that black is the result of rainwater bringing particulate matter, including lead and other particulates, back to the surface. Now, the data on the right, I want you to imagine that you could go to this rock and you could drill into the rock from the surface down several centimeters. What we're looking at here is the concentration of a variety of different metals that are in the coating, so this is the black surface, and notice that the concentration of all of these metals, including lead and nickel and copper and sulfur and arsenic and iron and silicon, they're all high within the portion of the coating, and then they all decrease to background levels. 
So these are data that also unequivocally fingerprint the source of particulate matter in the coating to local smelting operations. And epidemiologists have used these data, among others, to really investigate the potential transfer of metal contaminants or metals that can cause harm to humans, the transfer of those metals from the surfaces such as playgrounds or soils or local parks onto children's fingers and into their mouth where they can then cause cognitive delay in addition to other health challenges. And then the data at the top of here, the top here are two maps, lead and arsenic. And what we know from epidemiological studies is that when we look at the coating versus the rock, we can see red here is high concentration, and then greens and yellows and blues would be lower concentration. We can see a perfect correlation between increasing arsenic and increasing lead. And again, these are part of a much larger data set that allow epidemiologists and other members of the medical community to understand the history or the source of these metals in the Sudbury region. And there's lots of papers that have been written about this. This is one I pulled from a journal a few years ago. So if you're interested in this or you're interested in public health, I'd encourage you to talk with me or look through the literature for similar types of papers. And these are additional data here for so the top here, we've got a map of Sudbury, top and bottom. And all I want to illustrate is on the right-hand side, we have concentrations of lead and the lower right concentrations of arsenic. And what scientists have done is they have gone around the entire Sudbury area to try and understand the concentrations of lead and arsenic in soils and surface rock coatings so they can also understand how to direct the government and mining companies to work in partnership to clean up the environmental degradation. Without a doubt, the source of lead and the source of arsenic is from smelters. So why is that a problem beyond the metal particulates? All right, it's hopefully obvious to everyone that if lead causes cognitive delay in children, we want to minimize the amount of lead or ultimately reduce it to zero. So I just again want to use a few chemical reactions to introduce another major negative impact that smelting has had on the environment. So again, here's our non-balanced simplified reaction for smelting chalcopyrite. And all I want you to see is chalcopyrite plus oxygen liberates copper and produces sulfur dioxide. And then if you notice here, additional reactions occur in the atmosphere. Sulfur dioxide reacts with water to form sulfurous acid, and then other substances in the upper atmosphere catalyze a reaction between sulfurous acid and oxygen to produce sulfuric acid, which is this substance here lower right, H2SO4. H2SO4 is a relatively strong acid, and it's soluble in water. And one of the observations in Sudbury and elsewhere around the world in the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s and today is that the release of sulfur dioxide from smelting and also from the combustion of fossil fuels, which I'll touch on in today's lecture, that sulfur dioxide, it is not the case that dilution is the solution to pollution. That sulfur dioxide reacts with water and then oxygen to produce sulfuric acid, which is a major component of rainwater that we now call acid rain. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid, and it readily dissociates in water. And when it dissociates, it releases a hydrogen ion, which is shown by this reaction here. And again, remember that any aqueous fluid, in this case water, that contains a high concentration of dissolved hydrogen ions, that makes the water acidic. So the presence of sulfuric acid causes the concentration of hydrogen ions to increase dramatically. And as a result, the pH of the water decreases and the rainwater becomes acidic. And if we go back to our pH scale here on the bottom, and we remember that a pH of 7 is neutral, 
as we increase the hydrogen ion concentration to the left, the water becomes more acidic. And that means that acid rain, or rain that has high concentrations of dissolved sulfur, when it returns to Earth and falls as precipitation, it will have negative impacts on the environment. Here is a snapshot of sulfur dioxide emissions in the United States since 1850. The y-axis is billions of grams of sulfur dioxide. You don't have to memorize these numbers. It's the trend I want you to see. 1850 was a pivotal year because that is when in the United States we started, among other things, burning coal and burning oil for human uses that we had not before. So you can see here that sulfur dioxide concentrations increased, and they're not a systematic increase. I'll come back and touch on this. These are a variety of uh, economic recessions that hit the United States here. But you can see that sulfur dioxide levels have increased from 1850, where they were effectively zero, to being much more significant today. And I just want you to take the overall trend in here and ignore the blips, ups and downs. So what environmental problems does emitting SO2 cause and how do we know? Well, I mentioned acid rain, so I'm going to walk through that. Here are, I'm going to show you three photographs and I want to just make sure you see the difference between them or among them. Here we've got a cemetery in Chicago, the Concordia Cemetery. This is a marble statue that was installed a hundred years ago and it is completely surrounded by glass on the bottom, on the sides, and on the top. And if you look carefully, it is absolutely pristine. There is almost zero change in the facial features or any of the fingers here. All of the artistry in this statue from a hundred years ago is perfectly preserved. In the same cemetery is a second statue made from the same marble, and this statue has glass on top, and glass on the sides, but what I want you to see is that it has started to degrade. And so it still resembles the facial features that were there a hundred years ago, but is not as pristine as the statue on the left. And then we have a statue here that is completely open to the environment on all sides. And this statue had facial features similar to the statues in the center and the left when it was installed a hundred years ago. But what you can see is there's almost no residual facial features here at all. So the question is why? If you have three statues carved from the same marble a hundred years ago, and they're all installed in a cemetery in Chicago at the same time, and 100 years pass, how could you explain the statue on the left still looks like it was installed yesterday. The statue in the middle, yeah, it's degraded a little bit, but certainly has not degraded nearly as much as the statue on the right. The most plausible explanation is that we're looking at the effects of acid rain caused initially by emissions of sulfur dioxide from smelting and also from combustion of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And I say in real time, meaning human time scales. This is not something that's happening on long geologic time scales. This is happening on time scales that people saw this during their own lifetimes. So again, lots of reactions that we saw earlier. And all I want you to remember here is that when we combust sulfides, sulfur, with oxygen, they produce SO2. SO2 experiences reactions with water to produce sulfurous acid, which reacts with oxygen, to produce H2SO4, which is soluble in water. And all of this originates from combustion of sulfides, like that shown here lower left, and or shown here mixed with coal that is used to produce electricity on the lower right. And the reactions that we talked about a few minutes ago, just remember that as we increase the amount of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, we increase the concentration of hydrogen ions in rain. And when you increase the concentration of hydrogen ions in rain, you decrease pH. And decreasing pH means you now have an acidic fluid.
And that is the explanation for these data, for these observations. That in this case, marble is composed of calcium carbon and oxygen, calcium carbonate here shown as the formula on the upper left, reacting with sulfuric acid to produce carbon dioxide, sulfate, water, and CO2. And similar reactions could be written without sulfuric acid, but simply writing the reactions with hydrogen. So the most plausible, meaning the best scientific explanation for the observations of these three statues and the effects of rainwater on them over the last hundred years is acid rain. Now I'm going to show you a short video just to give you a sense of how acid rain affects not only statues, but how acid rain affects, in this case, plants. So we've got two plants. One of them we're going to water with vinegar, which is acidic, on the left. And one of them we're going to water with water, which is neutral on the right. So here we are week two. Here we are week three. And look at the differences. See if you notice anything different about the leaves. Here we are week four. And I apologize for the fuzziness. Just squint your eyes and go with it. By week five, notice the plant being watered with vinegar is starting to wither. And the one that was watered with the acid vinegar completely died by week six. I'll stop it here. So this plant completely died and the plant that was being watered with water remained very healthy. And then I'll just play this through so you can get a sense if you scale this up to larger parts of nature's ecosystem, what happens to whole forests that are affected by acid rain? So this is a forest that was downstream of a major smelting operation, and acid rain fell on this area for a period of years to decades. And you can see that as all of that acidic water hit the surface of the earth and penetrated into the soil, the soil becomes too acidic for the trees and the trees die. So here's just a close-up of that tree or those trees dying. So I use the example of the statues to introduce this, but this is what happens on larger scales. Whole forests that cannot survive when the soil is acidic. And then the last couple of images here just show you other examples of marble that have been degraded and headstones and cemeteries that have been degraded. So if you go back in time, and again, if you have grandparents or great-grandparents and you ever want to ask them about their memory of acid rain, when I was growing up and going to school in the 1970s and 1980s, acid rain was a major part of the K-12 science curriculum. And at the time, it was somewhat controversial because the scientific community was still trying to fully understand all of the reactions that could happen in the atmosphere, how those reactions would increase hydrogen concentrations in rainwater, how the hydrogen ion concentrations in rainwater would then translate to acidic soils, and how those acidic soils would become inhospitable for the growth of trees and other plants. We also had other evidence for the effects of smelters. So here on the lower left is the state of Arizona. And I'm just going to show you here on the right-hand side is a photograph of a mining operation, give or take 100 years ago. And you can see several smelters here. And you can see the smoke that is the byproduct of smelting sulfides being vented to the atmosphere. And again, dilution is the solution to pollution. On the map here on the left, I showed you in one of the previous lectures a video. Here's Phoenix and here's Resolution when we were talking about siting tailings ponds. Arizona ranks as the number one state in mining production. And Arizona has had lots of issues over the last hundred years related to the effects of smelting. I'm going to plot some data now to give you a sense of other than acid rain and degradation, how humans observed 
visibly the effects of smelting. So we've got a timeline on the x-axis going back from 1950 through about 1980. On the left y-axis is the percent of hours with visibility less than 40 miles. So over the course of a year, from sunup to sundown, dawn to dusk, people would use human eyes and also cameras, and they would inventory how many hours you could see more than 40 miles with the naked eye and how many hours you could see less than 40 miles with the naked eye. And then on the right-hand side are SO2 emissions from Arizona smelters. And we know the emissions extremely well because all the smelters are required to report exactly how much sulfide they smelted. And we can calculate the total amount of sulfur dioxide. And this is tons per day. So now let's look at these data. There are two lines and two gray bars. The top line here, the dashed line, is visibility. Okay? And again, this is percent. So here we have, as a function of time, 40% of the hours during the day had visibility less than 40 miles. On the bottom, we've got a curve for sulfur dioxide. And all I want you to see here is that as sulfur dioxide levels go up, on average, visibility decreases. So the number of hours changes. Because as we increase the percentage here, that means there are fewer hours where we're seeing 40 miles or more. So you can see an almost statistical one-to-one -one correlation between increasing sulfur dioxide emissions and decreasing visibility. That's what I want you to take away from this. And this was the result of a study that took place over several decades. And as a result, it led to emission controls and smelter closings that have had a huge positive impact on the local environment and ecosystem, and I'll talk about that. And then the last thing I'll mention on this slide are the two gray lines here. Those are global recessions in 1959 and 1966. And I'll come back and talk about those because as you can see here, global recessions result in less consumption because humans around the world have less discretionary income Less income means less buying, less consumption, and less mining. And when there's less mining, there's less smelting, there's less SO2 emissions. Less SO2 emissions or fewer SO2 emissions mean increased visibility. More hours per day that you can see 40 miles. So now I'm going to play a couple of videos just to give you a sense of what it was like. And I'm just going to ask you to suffer through the old videos, but I want you to get a sense of what life was like if you went back 40, 50, 60 years and you lived in one of these areas with the smelters. The sky, too, is everyone's sewer. This is the great airlift. Thousands of tons of daily rubbish on a free ride. So what I wanted you to see here is just a sense of what it was like in these areas. And I'll turn the volume down. But these are areas that had smelters and or they were manufacturing installations, factories, where coal or other fossil fuels were being burned. And remember I mentioned this concept, dilution is the solution to pollution. By the early 1970s into the 1980s, we had really, meaning we, the broader community, not just the scientific community, but the broader human community, came to recognize the negative impacts of the release or the emission of all of these gases, including SO2 and the particulate matter. 
And here are just some still images from several decades ago. Top left, this is not water vapor. This is New York City coated with smog. Bottom left, this is Birmingham, Alabama coated with smog. And if you look here at the bottom, Birmingham was a steel producing city. So these are smelters at a coal plant where they are using coal to generate electricity locally and convert iron ore to steel. Top right, we've got Los Angeles, 1948, just blanketed with smog. And then lower right, this was not a joke. Lower right, we've got people who would go out into the desert away from Los Angeles, fill up balloons of air, and then bring them into Los Angeles and let people breathe them so they would get fresh air. If you've ever been to Mexico City, you can actually find areas in Mexico City where you can buy fresh air, or you may have seen this at airports around the world, these so-called oxygen bars. So post-World War I through post-World War II, humans in the developed world, as we were increasing our built infrastructure, this was part of our daily reality. So I'm going to play you another video now that interviews somebody who lived through this time and gives you a sense of, from his perspective, how the environment was changing. For those of us born in the digital age, it's not every day we get to look at images like this. Each of these tiny translucent photos holds a moment in history, and in this room, there are thousands of them. This is environmental photographer Arthur Tress, and if Instagram were around in the 1960s, Arthur would be its king. I like showing people in relationship to the world around them, even if I'm doing a portrait or a cityscape, or the effect of man's relationship to nature, how he modifies it and changes it. Arthur is a Brooklyn native, and in the 1960s and 70s, he used his camera to show the changing landscape surrounding New York City. And during this time, the area was a mess. The entire waterfront was just piled with junk. There were huge garbage landfills that were spilling all this toxic uh, water into the area's neighborhoods. These great chimneys belching out black smoke gives you an image of hell or the apocalypse. New York City wasn't always so ominous. In the 1940s, the city saw a great deal of post-World War II prosperity. Buildings rose from concrete to clouds as the skyline took shape and industry thrived. But in the decades to follow, the city began showing the negative effects of its industrial boom. When you'd go to your window, it'd be covered with dust and dirt. People would have a lot of cases of asthma and coughing and your eyes would burn. It was like what they have now in China, that big smog. During the 50s and 60s, New York City looked a lot like Beijing does today. Toxic smog has besieged Beijing for decades. And on some days, residents can't even leave their homes, and there are documented widespread health problems among its population, akin to the problems felt in New York. Now, the ill effects of toxic smog come down to these little guys, particulates, tiny microscopic solid particles or liquid droplets suspended in the air, commonly created by burning fossil fuels or wood, as well as power plants and industrial facilities. Particulates suspended in the air vary in size, but essentially, the smaller they are, the deeper they can penetrate your respiratory system, or even your bloodstream. The EPA considers any particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers in diameter extremely hazardous to breathe. And if you can't wrap your head around how small that is, then think about a human hair, which is around 70 micrometers in diameter. That's 30 times larger than fine particulates. Today, these fine particulates are monitored and measured by an air quality index, or AQI for short, where a range of 0 to 50 is considered safe. To put Beijing's pollution crisis into perspective, over the past five years, the city saw readings as high as 755. That's so bad, there isn't even a category for it. However, in the 1960s, air pollution wasn't really measured in this way which does make it difficult to draw a quantifiable comparison 
What we do know is that scientists in the 1960s did report extremely elevated levels of damaging air pollutants, such as carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide in New York City. In 1966, during a period of elevated air pollution known as the killer smog, researchers found an increase in death rate of 24 fatalities per day. And the medical community acknowledged the toll air pollution was taking on people's health, with one city medical examiner remarking, on the autopsy table, it's unmistakable. The person who spent his life in the Adirondacks has nice pink lungs. The city dwellers are black as coal. But for those who lived outside of the city, some of the most impactful evidence of the hazardous pollution that plagued New York were photographs, like Arthur's. And his photos became an important catalyst in the fight to clean up the city. The movement for doing that began with me, actually, in the 1960s. The images I created, like uh, a thunderstorm over New York Cemetery or the man coming through the smoke, became very well known as kind of uh, environmental imagery. Arthur's images were published in magazines and put on posters in the hopes that they would be seen by those who had the power to enforce change. We must act, and act decisively. It is literally now or never. In the 1970s, President Richard Nixon introduced environmental policies and programs intended to clean up America. He created the Environmental Protection Agency, and companies dumping toxic waste into waterways and releasing pollutants into the air were finally held accountable. When the EPA came along and said, no, you can't keep doing that. We have clean water and clean air standards. You know, it wasn't easy. It took time because these corporations fight back as much as they can. But eventually it, it did turn the tide. Over time, New York City transformed into the metropolis we know today. And throughout the past several decades, we've learned just how fragile the environment really is. The photographs were not only important for themselves at the time, but became a reference for the future. And as we face an uncertain future, Arthur's images will continue to help remind us how easily we could revert back to a toxic world. It may come as a surprise that President Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency, but protecting the planet wasn't always so political. Check out our video here. Thanks for watching Seeker and make sure to like and subscribe for new videos every day. So what happened? Right, let's go back and look at an image I showed you a few minutes ago. These are sulfur dioxide emissions and again I'll highlight anthropogenic sulfur dioxide emissions. Anthropogenic meaning human emissions. These are not volcanic eruptions. There's no other source for these SO2 emissions. These are the emissions directly related to industry and manufacturing. And again, ignore the slight ups and downs here and look at the trend and then look at what happens here, 1972. 1972, we start to see a decline and it's a precipitous decline. Over the span of about a decade to a decade and a half, we see a significant decrease in SO2 emissions that did not correlate with a global recession, meaning that the economy did not slow down. So how do you explain these emissions decreases? This guy. So Nixon gets a lot of negative press but among the things that he did during his presidency is he signed into law the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and also Title IX. And there's a lot of criticism that Nixon only did this because he wanted to deflect criticism because of the Vietnam War. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. This quote from Nixon here was among those that he made during speeches where he talked about the importance of cleaning up the environment and the video I just showed you that focuses on the photographer in New York City the statues in Chicago by the late 1960s humans were seeing the environmental degradation through their own eyes not on geologic timescales but on human timescales and there was tremendous pressure put on the Nixon administration that in 1970 caused him 
to enact the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act is the first major piece of federal legislation that started to regulate or force industry to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide and particulate matter. And that is why we see this significant decline in 1972, in this case, of anthropogenic sulfur dioxide emissions. That's the answer. And we can see here that by the late 1970s into the 1980s, there had been a significant decline, but then we plateaued. So what we know is that after Nixon signs the Clean Air Act into law, after he creates the Environmental Protection Agency, we see a decrease in sulfur dioxide emissions, but then we see less of a decrease here through the 1980s. So what happened there? Well, here are two maps on the top that show you data collected from rainfall or atmospheric measurements in 1990. And again, if we look at the image on the bottom, and all I want you to think about here is SO2 and other gases such as NOx are being emitted at smelters or during combustion of fossil fuels. The dilution to is the solution to pollution just doesn't work. So all of those gases are being absorbed in the atmosphere, converting that atmospheric water or rainwater to acidic water and then falling back onto the surface. If you look at the maps here, you can see this is a map of pH, where again, red means acidic, high concentration of hydrogen. Green means less acidic, closer to neutral. Neutral pH for a rainwater is about 5.7 because it always contains some proportion of dissolved gases. And you can correlate the acidity of rainwater with the sulfate concentrations on the right. I'll highlight this one right here. This is a smelter in Utah. And then if we move over here to the right, you can see the high concentrations in red of sulfate correlate with high concentrations of hydrogen and acidic water. So these measurements that were being made in real time in the 1980s, no one could argue against what caused the high sulfur concentrations and how high sulfur concentrations caused high hydrogen concentrations and low pH or acidic rainwater. So in the early 1990s, I'm going to play you another video now, we had another president, George Bush, and George Bush was pressed by Republicans in Congress to amend the Clean Air Act to increase the level of regulation on industry across the United States. In this room are Republicans and Democrats, leaders from both sides of the aisle in Congress, governors, executives from some of the most important companies and business organizations in America, leading conservationists, and people who have devoted their lives to creating a cleaner and safer environment. And I've invited you here today to make a point. With the leadership assembled in this room, we can break the stalemate that has hindered progress on clean air for the past decade. With the minds, the energy, the talent assembled here, we can find a solution. So let me tell you the purposes of this morning's gathering. First, I'd like to lay on the table my proposals to curb acid rain and cut urban smog and uh, clean up air toxics. And second, I want to call upon all of you to join me in enacting into law a new Clean Air Act this year. But first, we should remember how far we've come and recognize what works. The 1970 Clean Air Act got us moving in the right direction with national air quality standards that were strengthened by amendments in 1977. Since 1970, even though we have 55% more cars going 50% farther, in spite of more utility output and more industrial production, we've still made progress. Lead concentrations in the air we breathe are down 98%. Sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide cut by over a third. Particulate matter cut 21%. Even ozone 
uh, causing emissions have been cut by 17 percent. And still, over the last decade, we have not come far enough. Too many Americans continue to breathe dirty air, and political paralysis has plagued further progress against air pollution. We have to break this logjam by applying more than just federal leverage. We must take advantage of the innovation, energy, and ingenuity of every American. The environmental movement has, long, has a long history here in this country. Uh, it's been a force for good for a safer, healthier America. And as a people, we want and need that economic growth. But now we must also expect environmental responsibility and respect the natural world. And this will demand a national sense of commitment, a new ethic of conservation. And I reject the notion that sound ecology and a strong economy are mutually exclusive. So last week, I outlined five points of a new environmental philosophy. One, to harness the power of the marketplace. Two, to encourage local initiative. Three, to emphasize prevention instead of just clean up. Four, to foster international cooperation. And five, to ensure strict enforcement. Polluters will pay. I'm going to stop it there and just emphasize that he talks about eliminating the political logjam, and he emphasizes prevention instead of cleanup, and that's something that's critical. So what George Bush Sr. here did was he introduced Clean Air Act amendments that allowed the free market to develop solutions to prevent emissions rather than emitting and cleaning up after degradation happened. And this was an historic moment, and I can't understate the significance of the fact that Republicans led this program. So the Clean Air Act amendments that he signs into law here with Vice President Dan Quayle, okay, it passed the House and the Senate overwhelmingly, and the concept here is that it used a market-based approach, the use of market-based principles. So they were legislating that you had to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions. Remember he says that by 1990, lead emissions had decreased 98%. Sulfur dioxide emissions had decreased only a third since the original Clean Air Act Amendment of 1970. So we were doing the broader we we're doing a much better job with some pollutants than others. And in this case, sulfur dioxide, it still was being emitted at a much higher rate than, we, than, than could be tolerated. There are lots of great articles written about this, and I just again want to highlight because this will come up in, in subsequent lectures. The Democrats were initially resistant. Now fast forward to 2020. Could you possibly imagine President Trump signing into law amendments that would create more strict regulation for air pollution? It's just unthinkable. And could you imagine the Republicans coming up with this idea and the Democrats being resistant? Again, unthinkable. But this was a very different time. And by 1990, the consensus among all Democrats and all Republicans, well, maybe not all, because you can see here the Senate passed it 89 to 10 and the House 401 to 25, but let's call that all. There was broad consensus on both sides of the political aisle that a system that we now know as cap and trade could result in decreasing sulfur dioxide emissions. Now, cap and trade, what that means is that the federal government imposed an upper limit on the amount of sulfur dioxide that could be emitted, and individual companies could either reduce their emissions so that they would comply with that cap, or they could trade with other companies who already had very low emissions, and in essence, they could sell the difference between their low emissions and the cap to other companies. So it didn't mean that all companies had to necessarily comply right away. 
There, again, are lots of great articles about this, and I'd invite you to talk with me at, during office hours. But the proposal that was put into place in 1990, it worked. By 2010, if we look at the economics, because one of the big criticisms in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president is that if the federal government imposed regulation on industry, it would have a negative economic impact. So I'll let you read this here for a few seconds. And then I'll highlight for you the low cost and the tremendous economic benefit. So today what we hear from the Republican Party is the opposite. We're back to the 1980s where the current Republican Party claims that any legislation will cripple industry. And we know from past experience the opposite is true. And this is a great article I highlight here in the Smithsonian Magazine. If you want to read about the political history of cap and trade, I'd strongly encourage you to read it. Very unbiased, middle of the road assessment of this entire process. And it worked. So if we look here, this is smelting at Bingham Canyon. The y-axis is SO2 emission rate. And all I want you to see is through the 80s into the early 90s, we see a significant decline in sulfur dioxide emissions starting in the early to mid 1990s. That was driven by technologic ingenuity as a result of having to comply with cap and trade. And I'll show you what that means. So what President Bush said is the Clean Air Act amendments were designed to stimulate industry to reduce SO2 emissions during the manufacturing or smelting process rather than emitting them and cleaning them up later. So what engineers did is they figured out a way to scrub SO2 out of the waste stream from smelting. So this is a schematic and I'll play you a video in a minute and I just want to highlight there are two types of scrubbing, dry scrubbing and wet scrubbing. The main takeaway here is the sulfur dioxide in the top reaction and the bottom reaction. That sulfur dioxide that historically was just vented to the atmosphere, right? Dilution is the solution to pollution. Well, by the 1980s, we knew that that was pure shit, okay? Now we know that we need to scrub SO2 in order to prevent it from being emitted to the atmosphere. So engineers and chemists figured out a way to add two calcium compounds to SO2 in the chimney, and within the chimney, the calcium compounds in SO2 react to produce calcium sulfate in both bottom and top, and that calcium sulfate is dense, it's a mineral phase, it's a solid, it's denser than air, and it sinks to the bottom, and it is used to produce gypsum, which is drywall. So if you're sitting in a room right now and you tap on the wall, most likely your wall is made of gypsum and that gypsum today is overwhelmingly produced by this process. So I'll play you a video now to demonstrate how it happens. So this is a wet scrubber where we're using calcium hydroxide. We've got sulfur dioxide coming in here. Okay, so this is coming into a separate chimney and that's the orange. And these nozzles up at the top, imagine these as little shower heads, that's what they are. And these nozzles up here are spraying a solution, and that sulfur dioxide has to pass through the solution in order to escape. And notice that it does not. So what's escaping here are other gases, such as water and carbon dioxide. But the pollutants, the, the sulfur dioxide, they're trapped by reacting, reacting with calcium hydroxide, forming a mineral, and that mineral sinks to the bottom of the chamber. Then the liquid is captured and recycled, 
So it's taken back around here up to the top and then it's resprayed onto new emissions that are pushed through the tank. So the process works. Now, why does the process work? Well, why does the process work? It works because the chemists and engineers know how to make it happen. But it also works economically. So when that sulfate material as a solid settles to the bottom of the chamber, it can be used to produce products that can be sold. Among those products, one is an ammonium sulfate fertilizer. So this process here, flue gas, in the video here, this is the flue and the sulfur dioxide is the gas. So we're capturing that gas. So this ammonium sulfate represents a revenue stream for the company. Now it's not new. If we go back to the 1920s, and again, here's just some historical tidbits. In the 1920s, there was actually a very famous suit. There was a landowner who sued an electric manufacturer. So the Barton Electri Electricity Works, they were smelting or they were combusting coal. And the SO2 emissions, the farmer claimed, were harming the soil on the farmer's land. And the House of Lords in England agreed. And there's lots that's been written about this as well. And so in 1931, that is the first flue gas desulfurization plant ever built. And this is flue gas desulfurization. So the sulfur is coming in and we are desulfuring it. So we're removing sulfur from the gas. So the gas is being emitted do not produce acid rain and do not produce acid soils. Now, that's the 1930s, but after World War II, London forgot that message. And I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot of what happened in London in the year 1952, the year called the Heavy Smog. On the 5th of December 1952, the Great Smog of London descended on the British capital due to a combination of air pollution and weather conditions. To maximise revenues in the aftermath of the Second World War, the British government had opted to export the country's better quality hard coal and retain the more sulphurous low-grade coal for domestic consumption. Smoke from burning this coal in domestic fires to offset the particularly cold winter of 1952 combined with pollutants from Greater London's numerous power stations, factories and public transport to create a thick, noxious blanket of smog over the city. The thick, yellow-black smog was held over London for more than four days due to the arrival of a high-pressure weather system. This caused an anticyclone that stopped the polluted air from rising into the atmosphere. Windless conditions and London's position in a river valley also meant that the smog was unable to be blown away. Visibility in the city was reduced to just a few metres, bringing public transport to a halt and forcing schools and businesses to close. Meanwhile, people across the city breathed in the toxic air and began to succumb to respiratory infections. Cattle at the Smithfield show at Earl's Court reportedly suffocated, and while nobody made the connection until several months after the smog had lifted, Estimates state that between four and 12,000 Londoners died as a direct result of breathing the polluted air. In response, the government began to rethink its policy towards air pollution and, in 1956, introduced the Clean Air Act that established smoke control areas where only clean fuels could be burned, precipitating a shift towards the use of cleaner coals, electricity and gas as sources of heat. So the takeaway that I want you to have from the video is we have to wait until it gets truly bad before we enact legislation to improve the environment. Now this is just a short animation I'll show you here. I've had a lot of people over my career ask me how do we know that combustion of fossil fuels or smelting of chalcopyrite releases sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. This is a video of an area where oil is being extracted from below the surface. 
and sulfur is a component in oil. And all of the yellow that you see here are plumes of, of sulfur dioxide. So again, we're using instruments, not the naked eye, but instruments that are tuned so that they can sensitively detect sulfur dioxide. And in this case, you can literally trace the source of the sulfur dioxide to an exact spot on the surface of the Earth. And we know at that spot what activity is causing that sulfur dioxide to be, re to be released. So there's no debate about the source of sulfur dioxide. And there's no longer any debate about the negative impact that sulfur dioxide emissions can have on the atmosphere. So if we go back through time, and you can look up more of these details on your own, by 1973, there were 42 flue gas desulfurization units in operation, 36 in Japan and 6 in the U.S. The numbers are not relevant for you to memorize. By 2018, flue gas desulfurization units were being used in 30-plus countries, and there were nearly 700 units around the world. Why? Partly because it was legislated, but also because it allows companies to recover sulfur in a way that they can market and make revenue from. And that was what was very critical about the Clean Air Act amendments signed by President Bush in 1990. It was the intersection of a market-based approach and an environmental plea to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions, to decrease acid rain, and decrease soil acidity. And you can see here, these are photographs on the bottom of drywall. Again, knock on your wall, and that's what's behind the wall here. Behind the paint is drywall in this core with paper on the outsides. And you can see here a home being built, all of the drywall that's being mudded here at the seams. And all I want you to see in the image at the top this is production of U.S. gypsum, millions of tons. And from 1900, you can see until about 1970-ish, all of that gypsum was mined gypsum for mineral deposits. All of this in blue over here is gypsum that's produced by flue gas desulfurization. And that gypsum now has started to take over the market. So an economic solution to improving the environment. That doesn't mean that the same approach could be used for carbon dioxide, and I'll touch on that in a future lecture. So just some more data to convince you it's worked. Here, if we look at black metals processing, the y-axis is thousands of tons of sulfur dioxide. The x-axis is time from 1970 when the first Clean Air Act amendments were signed into legislation by President Nixon. You can see metals processing sulfur dioxide emissions have gone almost to zero. Sulfur dioxide emissions from combustion of fossil fuels to produce electricity have significantly declined. You can see again here thousands of tons. This is particulate matter. And all I want you to see is since 1970, a significant decline almost to zero, but not quite there yet, of particulate matter. Volatile organic carbon, something I haven't talked about and I'm not going to spend much time on. Metals processing, you can see, has decreased significantly. But I want to show this because if I focus your eyes here, this increase in volatile organic carbon is related to hydraulic fracturing, something that I'll come back and talk about in a future lecture, where that has significantly increased in your lifetime. Carbon monoxide also significantly decreased time average since 1970. So when you look at the record following the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments and ignore the increase in volatile organic carbon that's a result of hydraulic fracturing here, the data demonstrate that environmental legislation does work. And as a result, if you look at the emissions here from 1850, we follow them through some economic issues, ups and downs. Here's 1970, and you can see the plateau. Here's 1990, and you can see that they are on the decline, and one can hope eventually will reach zero. And as a result, if we go back, the top two images are those I've shown before. Here we have the sulfate concentration of rain on the top right, 
On the top left, we've got the hydrogen ion concentration, highest in red, meaning more acidic, lowest pH. Notice the same measurements in the same area in 2013 on the bottom. There are certainly still some challenges, but overall, we can see the results of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments have significantly reduced sulfur dioxide emissions, which has significantly reduced the hydrogen ion concentration of rainwater, which has led to rains that are now less acidic, meaning closer to neutral than they were decades ago. We see this repeated around the world. So the y-axis is sulfur dioxide, same x-axis from 1850, and for a range of countries here, I just want you to see that over the same time frame that I've focused on the United States, we see a decline in sulfur dioxide emissions, and this MDC is more developed countries. So here's the question I'll leave you with. Is that the whole story for emissions? I've laid out the case that regulations work. There are market-based solutions that stimulate companies to reduce emissions. There are revenues that can be made in the case of sulfur by producing gypsum drywall and producing ammonium sulfate fertilizers. So the big question is, are we all done? And the answer is no. And I'll get to that in the next lecture.